for centuries, the Serbs had been under the occupation of the Ottoman Empire until they finally gained their de facto independence after the uprising of 1815. Many decades later, their efforts in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878 would grant them full independence, leading to the creation of the Kingdom of Serbia. But the Serbs were far from done. Inspired likely by the efforts of the Italians and then later the Germans, and certainly their own past history, many Serbs dreamed of a united Serb people. Many Serbian politicians and nationalists were inspired by the works of Ilij Gerasanin, where he designed the programme for the national and foreign policy of Serbia. This work's primary commandment was the unification of all Serbs, stating where a Serb dwells, that is Serbia. The geographical blueprints for this kingdom were based off the Serbian Empire of Stepan Dusan, a mighty Balkan power during the medieval period. They could therefore argue that any expansion into neighbouring regions was their historical right of reunification. This dream, however, would put them at great odds with their powerful neighbours, the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who still occupied most of that land. This led them directly into the Balkan Wars, where they experienced their kingdom over double in size. Nationalism was rife in Serbia on the lead-up to the First World War. The major issue for them was not all those the Serbians would call Serb would have called themselves Serb. As you can see by this map here, the region is full of many cultures, all spread out in a way that makes borders where everyone can be happy impossible. And God forbid that we ever return to the border days of the Holy Roman Empire. This overall makes Serbian foreign policy a weird one. Most other nations discussed in the series will be great powers, more concerned with power projection and maintaining what they believe to be the balance of power. But Serbia had a different goal in mind altogether. This often became a problem and makes it seem only logical in hindsight why the First World War would begin here. Although it must be acknowledged that many historians believe all this talk was merely at least at first, something for the press, to get the people excited and to bolster the support of the government. Besides unification, Serbia also wished for access to the Adriatic Sea for the naval potential. Serbia shared common religious and cultural ideologies with Montenegro. This led to a strong alliance in 1897. Montenegro gains a stronger ally who can help if the Austro-Hungarians invaded and Serbia could use their ports. There was only one problem. Austria owned the region of Novi Pazar and blocked Serbian access. This they would later return to the Ottomans to only then be conquered by Serbia. Out of this nationalism formed a secret police known by the name Union or Death, also known as the Black Hand. The movement was founded by leaders in the army and grew in such popularity that its fingers stretched into the Serbian government itself. The excited words of action, most likely only meant to impress the people, were now met with expected results. Relations with government were friendly at first, but this began to turn in 1914, as they believed the Prime Minister, Nikola Pasic, lacked the aggression required for unification. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated on the 28th of June 1914, triggering what is known as the July Crisis. On the 23rd of July, Serbia receives an ultimatum from Austria-Hungary, accept or we will attack. The ultimatum went as follows. It starts by stating Serbia must accept Bosnia's position as under Austro-Hungarian rule and must push for peace going forwards. However, then accuses the Serbian government of knowing of and ignoring the existence of the Black Hand organisation, 
It goes on to state that the tolerance towards this movement by the government and the authorities behind the movement meant that Serbia itself was to blame for the actions of the terrorist organisation. The punishment goes as follows. The Serbian royal government must condemn the anti-Austro-Hungarian propaganda and any desire to dismantle the empire. That it regrets the anti-empire thoughts and actions carried out by Serbia in the past and, lastly, that they would investigate the entire population of their nation to find all those guilty of the assassination plot. Furthermore, the Black Hand must be destroyed as an organisation. All past officials who had publicly been against the Empire must be trialled and removed from the office if in the army. To ensure that it was done appropriately, Austria-Hungary demanded that their own delegates are involved in Serbia with law enforcement. And lastly, the Serbian government must ensure no weapons ever cross the border again. They had 48 hours to accept this. Serbia initially resisted and went to seek help from Russia. Russia turned them down, advising Serbia to just accept it. Some historians argue Serbia accepted all points, but point six, the one allowing Austro-Hungarian delegates across the border to intervene and oversee law enforcement. Other historians argue Serbia instead drew up their own agreement, a compromise, but this missed most of the points mentioned. A major issue for Serbia was the sheer power and influence the Black Hand held. If Pasik wished for peace and had accepted the terms, the whole nation could likely have crumbled into civil war, a Black Hand takeover, and then would have possibly resulted in war anyway. Serbia refused and so Austria-Hungary declared war. I hope you enjoyed and learnt something. Leave a like if you did, subscribe to get notified of next week's video on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Share with anyone you think may be interested. This has been the history of diplomacy.